Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Jamie Park and I'm a North Korean defector human rights activist. So today in this channel, I have a very special guest. So his name is, is Kenny Xu. He is an author of the new book called An Inconvenient Minority. He is also the president of the nonprofit called Color Us Blind. So Kenny, welcome to my channel. So do you wanna is I mean just talk about your book starting off? I think that'd be a really good good point for the audience to know who you are and what this book is really about. Of course. Um Yunmi, it's an honor to be here. I love everything that you do. And so my book, An Inconvenient Minority, which is out now, is about the preservation of meritocracy in America and how one minority is critical to preserving meritocracy in America. Uh, you know, Asian Americans are traditionally some of the highest achieving groups in America right now, and they have been able to achieve the American dream. Um, even though they're a minority race, because they work hard, they study hard. You know, their parents didn't come here with any connections. They didn't come here with any privileges, but they did come here in search of freedom. And they found it in America, and they've been able to build the American dream for themselves. But now you have an ideology now, a race ideology. Critical race ideology is what some people call it. And it teaches people that merit is racist. And it teaches people that, you know, if you that America is a systemically racist country. But how can, how is that possible with Asian Americans? Because we are a minority race and we have been discriminated against, but we are still able to be successful in this country. And I think it proves the whole race ideology wrong. And that's mm -hmm. what my book, An Inconvenient Minority, really tries to cover. Wow, I mean, that's so powerful. I think we're going to have so much to talk about today. <laughs> I mean, myself went to Columbia University and I was literally saying, like, you know, even North Korea wasn't this nuts mm -hmm. <laughs> about this walkism in these elite institutions. And you cover that in your book. Right? I mean, what struck me the most is that all these people talking about equity, right? Mm -hmm. How yeah. would you, I mean, differentiate or define equity versus equality? Um, I would define equity as I would define equity as you want certain racial outcomes. Um, so when somebody uh, says, "Oh, we want equitable treatment of, of of black people in the admissions process," that means that doesn't mean we want to admit people based on their merit. It means we want to admit enough black Americans until they reach. 15% of the population or until they reach 20% of, of whatever uh, class you're trying to sculpt. It's basically race communism. That's what it is. Um, because it's saying we need, um, we need to force p certain races into these positions even though they're not qualified for them. And of course the consequence of equity is that Asian Americans are unfairly discriminated against because Asian Americans tend to do well at these universities like at Harvard University. Asian Americans uh, apply to Harvard with really great grades. They actually are the, the, the best grades and the best test scores. But Harvard enforces a penalty against Asian Americans in order to keep Asian Americans below 20% of their college class. Um, and so you're not treating people on the basis of merit anymore. You're treating people on the mm -hmm. basis of race for equity. Wow. That's, I mean, like what made the Western civilization great was exactly I give this meritocracy, right? right. The self-responsibility. And now it seems like there's a huge attack on it. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you know where this is coming from? Why suddenly America is treating this direction that is very communist, artificially <laughs> trying to create the equal outcome? For everyone. So I think there's there's a this is a difficult question, difficult mm -hmm. ex explanation. But I will attempt to explain it by showing you, you know, we have had a an experiment in in America for the past fifty years um, to try to uh, boost Black and Hispanic achievement in this country, um, which needs to be boosted. It really does. You know, over the mm -hmm. past fifty years, we've had a welfare state. Um, we've had affirmative action, you know, we've had, um, 
you know, we spent a ton of money into our education system and we still see, you know, lower rates of, of, of black achievement in, in, the, in the public school system. And mm -hmm. this, I think, angers educators. It, it, edu it angers people because mm -hmm. they're like, well, why, why, what are we doing? What's wrong? What's going, what's an issue? And the truth is there are many things that are, that are an issue here you know, with the black and Hispanic communities and um, with that, that are in their own culture, but are also a result of policy. Um, but, mm -hmm. but I think people have gotten frustrated with that and now they want to force black achievement, even though it's not merited. So I think that's where the push for equity has come through. It's actually come from people getting frustrated with the fact that, um, the achievement gap still remains um, and they want to fix it, but they want to do it in a forcible way. And that's very, I mean, for me, it's very upsetting because like, <laughs> I think one of the examples you're using is that the NBA, vast yeah. majority of them are black players. Yeah. Right? But do, they do not artificially try to include the Asians in that group. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, it's because, it's because Asians have, comparatively little social capital in, or political capital in the United States. We have not learned how to be able to fight for our own rights. A lot of Asian Americans like to come here and we sort of like to stay quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there are exceptions. You know, you are one. And we, but, you know, um, historically, we, we stayed quiet. And because we've stayed quiet, we've allowed you know, colleges like Harvard to discriminate against us. And, you know, and when now this be has become a bigger thing, now that this is not just happening at Harvard, it's not just happening in the Ivy League, it's happening in every gifted, talented program in America right now. People are seeing there's too many Asians, there's too few black people. We need to forcibly admit more black people and forcibly cut Asians from the admission system. And now I think finally Asian Americans are starting to realize, hey, this is not only unfair, mm -hmm. this is something that if it allows to happen, it's just going to just, it's actually just going to destroy us. So we need to stand up for our rights and we need to stand up for the American dream of treating people on the basis of merit. So what wasn't very clear to me when I was reading the book is that, mm -hmm. so you in the Thomas High School, right? In that very famous number one high school in America, yeah. It's a very vigorous test to get in. Thomas and, Jefferson, yes. Right. And you said like seven over seventy percent are Asians in that school. Yeah. And because they are they need to meet the racial quota, they are only going after I mean Asians or the white people too, like who they are like eliminating, making more spots for the people who are not quite you know, meeting their standards. Yeah, they're going after the Asians. Only Asians? It's okay. funny because the new proposal, what happened was, and this was exactly as expected, the new proposal raised the number of black people, raised the number of Hispanic people, raised the number of white people, <laughs> and who got cut out? Half of the Asians. What, why white people? Because I think when elite progressives... In, in America right now mm -hmm. are content sort of letting, uh, giving handouts to black and Hispanic people. But when it comes to Asian people, they start to view Asian people as their competition. That's why. That's their competition. Because Asian people are, are given equal opportunity, are performing higher and at a higher rate. So now mm -hmm. you have these elite white progressives um, who are sort of okay with giving out more spots to black and Hispanic people as long as it also helps them. But it, mm -hmm. the result of that is they want to cut out Asian people. This is a what like made me really outraged yeah. to the point this white progressive people are saying in the name of, you know, equality, in the name of whatever inclusivity, mm -hmm. they, I did not know they were viewing us as a competitor. Yeah. I literally in the past was thinking, okay, these people are so innocent or naive to, they just really just heartbroken about the inequality with the black people or like Hispanic people. So they are like really trying to fix this problem, not trying to 
make themselves more like getting them more positions like that. Right. So this is like shocking truth for me. I did not know. Mm -hmm. So what other sectors are like where Asians became very inconvenient for the majority now? <laughs> Only other than this academic area. Is there other any any other areas? Well, I'm glad my, my book's title is catching on. <laughs> yeah, it is. Very good one. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Um, okay, well, so the, this ideology, critical race ideology, mm -hmm. critical race theory, it started at Harvard Law School. It went on Derek Bell, Roberto Unger, Kimberly Crenshaw. They all made this theory. They transferred it to all of the other Ivy Leagues. We transferred it to their universities. We transferred it into the public schools. And now you see a race ideology that wants to wipe out um, Asian American achievement in favor of other races everywhere. And now you see it in corporations, too. I wrote in my book, mm -hmm. Chapter 4, Diversity and Exclusion, I wrote in my book about Google and Facebook. You know, it's interesting because Google, Facebook, Google and Facebook's software engineers are 90% Asian. 90%. What? Yes. Oh my gosh. 90%. And mm -hmm. you know why? You know why? It's not because they want to hire more Asians. It's because they, they, they cannot find the qualified talent among the other races. So they have to hire Asians. In fact, they import people from China and from India to be able to do their high quality Google search and Facebook algorithms. And what happens is if you know you remove if you remove like a marketing manager at google or facebook okay it's maybe you'll harm them a little bit but it's not a big deal if you remove a software engineer from google and facebook your entire your entire business is ruined you know your entire product is ruined so they're reliant upon asian talent but at every level uh, at every level uh above the basic level um Asian American, um, Asian American promotion decreases, decreases. So there you have 90% software engineers, you know, you have 50% of Google's entire workforce, and you go down, 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 down until you get to management level, and it's only 20% Asian. Um, and you can say, okay, well, maybe because Asians lack communication skills. Okay, that's fine. But there is something even deeper here going on because now Google is running a diversity and inclusion program. And in their diversity and inclusion program, they specifically say we need to have equity. And so now they're in now they're actually intentionally trying to cut out even more Asians in favor of whites and blacks and Hispanics. So this is a racism. Yeah. So <laughs> wow. I mean, what? What would be solution to this? Like, how, how can we go against this injustice that is happening in this modern day in America, right? Like, we believe that America is going direction where color, your skin color doesn't matter anymore, right? The contents of character, mm -hmm. that's what matters. But it seems yeah. like America is going completely regressing when it comes to race. Yeah. And all it matters now is about color. I mean, though, just like I've been mean, like looking at this tweets, everybody's saying, in the especially liberals saying the fact that you refuse to see color, that means you're racist. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an even more harrowing example. You know, it's funny because they used to say that, you know, you, you, you know, or auditions for orchestra for mm -hmm. violin, like violin auditions, you know. They used to say, okay, so when you're you're biased, so you're biased against black and, and Hispanic violin players, that's why there's too so many, it's that's why you're admitting so many Asians into the orchestras. So they're saying, okay, let's do a blind audition system, which I support. I think you should do a blind audition system. You know, what that means that the person is behind a curtain or mm -hmm. something and you put on headphones and you're just listening to the violin you're not you don't see the person you don't see what it looks like it's kind of like the voice you know yeah and it's good it's a good system and it works but even with this system asians are still doing better than whites <sighs> than blacks mm -hmm. and so now they're saying now they're saying no we don't want to have a blind audition system <laughs> <laughs> oh they're trying everything they're literally trying everything 
Yeah, now they're saying, well, no, we need to go back and reinsert race so people can see it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's so bad. It is so ridiculous. We, we need to be as as race blind, as color blind as we can be. Mm-hmm. And the, the the attempt to make race a more um, to, to the attempt to fixate on race is harmful deeply to this country. Mm-hmm. So so in this like narrative, right, the I mean, mm-hmm. African-Americans had a history of like slavery. Hispa- mm-hmm. Hispanic people, I don't know, whatever the excuse they are using there, right? And yeah. they they now, like, almost looking at Asians as some kind of white people that we mm-hmm. are privileged as yeah. well. And and another thing also concerning to me is that, especially the first-generation immigrants are more, like, into free market, self-responsibility, all of these values. Yeah. But the recent young generation who were born in America, among Asians, who went to this Ivy League schools, they yeah. are vast majority of them becomes Democrats, yeah, and choose this like support this equity policies, yeah, and right, but they themselves are being discriminated by this law. So why do you think even this this kind of policy or trend even attracting us Asians to support it? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, the uh, um, so this issue is polarized Asian Americans. Um, and it's it's funny because the ones who tend to support t- discrimination against their own race mm. are elite college educated. Interestingly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, I know what you I, I know what you see at Columbia. Mm-hmm. I know what you saw. Mm-hmm. He, Asians are being taught to feel ashamed of their own race right now. To feel ashamed, why? Because um, they're being taught that, that, that their, this, um, that their own merit is an act of racism. Studying hard is an act of racism because now you're conforming to whiteness, you're conforming to white ideals. And there is an Asian American studies guy that I talked to and he said, the purpose of Asian American studies, and he he did he did a master's and a PhD in Asian American studies, so he knows what he was talking about. He said the purpose of Asian American studies right now is to criticize and interrogate Asian Americans and to celebrate blackness. And as a result, you've seen people like Eileen Huang, who is a Yale English major, um, who penned this uh, essay in ChineseAmerican.org that. Said, called an open letter to my Chinese American community, where she says, anti-blackness is ingrained within my Chinese American community. And what's her evidence? Her evidence is that she she witnessed a couple of racist grandmas, you know, say some bad things about some black Americans at one point. And it, are, is there racism? Of course there's racism, but guess what? There's racism from Asians against black Americans. There's racism from black Americans against Asian Americans. I mean... There was a guy who pushed an Asian American. There's a, a an African American man who pushed an Asian American down at, in the street in Brooklyn, calling him the coronavirus. You know, mm-hmm. and there's racism from whites against blacks, and there's racism from blacks against whites. And all of this to 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 say that one community needs to be celebrated while another community needs to be denigrated is the essence of racism. That is, I mean. Until that guy in Atlanta was shooting in the massage parlor, the mm-hmm. white guy was uh, killing a lot of Korean women, right? Until yeah. that point, the hate crime against Asian people were, unfortunately to say, majority were black people. Mm-hmm. A lot of them were coming from black community. I would and, say a lot of them. Yeah. It's not the majority. It's about 28% from black people, uh, about 25% from white people, and then the rest are... Hispanic people or Asians committing crimes against Asians, but it is the plurality black people. Yes. Interesting. So twenty eight percent is black people. Well, twenty percent, twenty eight percent of the attacks on Asian Americans. But you know, it's funny this whole idea of a hate crime, right? Because I mean, most crimes are motivated by hate. You know, so what does it mean <laughs> to be a, a, a hate crime? Mm-hmm. The funny thing is, the term hate crime is actually a politically motivated. Um, word. It's a politically motivated term. Basically, you have to go in front of a commission or a tribunal, and the mm-hmm. tribunal gets to decide whether it's a hate crime. 
And a hate crime specifically means a crime that is motivated mm -hmm. by um, a crime that is motivated by prejudice against uh, a, a you know specifically marginalized communities. So you know when somebody says, "Oh, this is a hate crime," mm -hmm. most crimes are crimes motivated by hate, but they really mean like a crime that is that is that the judge determined was primarily motivated by prejudice which of course is a is requires you to think about and evaluate a person's uh mental state which is subjective and it's very hard to do fascinating yeah. i mean i mean the fact that you call something a hate crime means that you are almost dividing creating more hate in people like imagine i guess like asian is like oh white people attack you now i'm gonna hate white people Right? right. The fact it's just not crime, but hate crime. Now it just all about became race. Race right. wars going on. And yeah, I completely can see that why this term is very not helping us. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's, yeah, it's, it's it's not. It's not, you know, and the, the result of all of this discourse, unfortunately, around anti Asian hate. Um, look, anti Asian hate exists. Racism exists. We know mm -hmm. this. But the, the result of all of this discourse around anti-Asian hate is that you're you're trying to you're trying to add unnecessary motivations that are specifically based in identity politics into something that you should really just treat it on the basis of an individual case, you know? Exactly. You're yeah. trying to form a narrative around this that turns Asians into a victim group. And mm -hmm. we don't want that. You don't want that in this country. What do you offer? Like, what's your guide for all of us now to move forward from this? Like, what what shall we do? <laughs> well, we well, what we have to do, you know, Asian Americans, and and the whole country, we all need to unite, and we need to fight for a common principle, and that mm -hmm. principle is meritocracy. That principle is colorblind meritocracy, where we say. We're not going to treat you on the basis of your race. We're going to treat you on the basis of the content of your character, not the color of your skin. So, you know, I I started my I started and and became president. I was actually recruited to become president of Color Us United, colorusunited.org. And that's our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is to be that advocacy arm because we know that those of you who are listening to this you know, are may may feel intimidated by your employer to speak out against him when he says we need everybody to take a diversity and inclusion training, you know, or we know that you may be intimidated because you're worried about the social backlash that comes forth. But, you know, we know what's going on in these institutions. And more importantly, we know how to fight it. Um, I fought the Proposition 16 campaign in California, where I fought against race preferences in admissions and hiring, and we won 57% to 43% with the American people. Then mm -hmm. I fought Harvard, and I exposed Harvard, and now I wrote this book to talk about the, this exposure. And so I know the strategy for how to tackle these institutions. Um, and so if, you know, I would encourage your listeners to go to colorrestunited.com, uh, .org, mm -hmm. and, to, and to sign up so that you know, we can be the voice and we can fight on your behalf. Absolutely. I will be the first one to sign up after this. I mean, I remember when I was at Columbia, exactly this case yeah. came out. The Harvard was, the Asians sued them, right? Sued the Harvard. And then, well, didn't it go to eventually go to Supreme Court? And then they found that there was no bias against Asians? Mm, well, so the it's or? in the Supreme Court right now. Is it right now? It is. Uh -huh. It went to the district court. The district court said, did, the district court did not say there was no bias against Asians. The district mm -hmm. court said that Harvard's use of race was acceptable. Oh. That's what the district court said. <laughs> this, is, this is the key that people need to understand. Yeah. Harvard has been given the ability to use race in admissions. It actually started from a Supreme Court case on its own in 1979, where people, you know, where, where Harvard won the ability to use race in the admissions process. Um, mm -hmm. And they said, of course, oh, we promise we're not going to do quotas. 
oh, we promise it's just going to be a teeny factor. It's not. It's a huge factor, and they use quotas. And so, and so this is why we're going to the Supreme Court right now. Mm-hmm. This is why we're going to the Supreme Court, because we need to expose Harvard for lying to the American people about their use of race, because it's everywhere now. And if people are continually allowed to use race in these kinds of things, it's going to destroy our country. So we're, we're going to fight every tooth and nail at the Supreme Court this year. It's, it's a really, I mean, like, even in Hollywood, right, Asian representation, I think it got increased after that crazy rich Asians. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What do you mean? What do you mean? I don't know. So I'm just wondering... Yeah. So, especially in the left, they are really pushing this agenda where mm-hmm. we artificially or like forcibly getting people represented in an equal manner. Mm-hmm. So, and then that means it goes against meritocracy. Yeah. But when it comes to like Hollywood, then I mean, it's hard to measure merits. Maybe you can measure it. So, it's very complex, like all about this now, like fair representation in the media, especially uh-huh. the Hollywood movies. And like they tra- trans people, gay people, Asians, black, Hispanic, all of that. And is there what Asians are, their status is there, really especially the media. So I, I, so I want more Asian representation in the media. Mm. There's no doubt. Mm-hmm. Just like mm-hmm. I want more black representation in top schools. I have mm-hmm. no... I have no problem saying that. You know, I want to help the underprivileged. I just don't think using race is the appropriate way to do it. And mm-hmm. in, in terms of Asians in the media, you know, too often we rely on the institutions to try to give us sort of handouts or hand-me-downs to try to get what we want. So we want Asians in media, and I talk about this in my book actually in chapter three, we want Asians in the media we can, I guess, beg the studios, could you give us more Asians in the media? Okay, fine, we'll give you crazy rich Asians. But crazy rich Asians um, was a very westernized you know, adaptation of Asians. And it didn't really do Asian Americans the justice that it thought Asian Americans would do. So what we have to do, there's no excuse for hard work and entrepreneurship. You know, we have to do what black Americans did with rap music. They came from the yeah. grassroots. They built their own empires. Mm-hmm. And they now rap music is all over the mainstream and it's taking over a culture and it's great. But they didn't rely on the big studios to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they sought to make it popular with America and they did. And the mm-hmm. Asians can do the same thing. You know, we have anime now, which is so popular, which came from Asia. You know, we have K-pop, which yeah. is wonderful. And we can we can teach people about our culture while at the same time advancing Asian American representation without having to go to the big studios and asking them to do us favors. So you really good to know that. So even in whatever sector it comes, usually promoting meritocracy and hard work and competition. That's no how matter should, what, yeah. there is no excuse for hard work. There is right. no. What was it like? on me in North Korea in terms of how they viewed excellence and hard work were you did you do you feel like it was encouraged to work hard there no because your family <laughs> status already determined even before you were born yes. so even you work hard to work doesn't mean anything right wow. because of your connections and what your great-grandfather did during the revolution and mm-hmm. they decide how much you need to be fed or not so it seems like that this like equity promise is like that in America. It doesn't matter. Hard work doesn't mean anything. If you are yeah. the wrong color, wrong race, wrong gender, you are mm-hmm. screwed. And there's no way you can change your own fate. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was seeing at Columbia where like white privilege, right? white guilt. And you cannot change your own race. That's the wow. thing you can never do. Exactly. Right? And that's, yeah, there's no forgiveness. There's no... Mo- there's no mercy. And there's and no... It, right. I mean, under the Korean theory, North Korean juche, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the your social class was determined before you were born. Your family status mm-hmm. determined who you were. And in China, 
if during the Cultural Revolution, if you were considered a political enemy, you know, you would you would be unfairly denied, you know, jobs, security, that kind of thing. You would be tortured, you'd be beaten. And in America right now, now we're dividing people into race. And mm-hmm. and now we're denying people privileges because of that. You know, all of this is 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 against what America is all about. Absolutely. I mean, the, do you think there is actually this like a pyramid, people say, right? If you are like blah, 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 in the top of the pyramid, like going down like this. Or, I mean, uh-huh. I, I couldn't believe like, oh, people were expecting me to be a victim, right? I'm a like yeah. women of color, I'm a rape victim, I'm blah, okay. blah, blah, blah. And then they, they don't know what to do with me. <laughs> right like yep. I'm not saying like I'm a victim I don't hate men I don't hate the West like they're like they are just so, so confused wow wow yeah I mean now this so this whole idea of you need to put yourself in this person of color group you know and mm-hmm. they try to, to goad you towards that but I, I'm so glad you rejected that because you saw through it and you know what it yeah. meant mm-hmm. exactly yeah. I mean we cannot let those things define us for sure yeah it's been the most fascinating conversation i mean everybody should pick up that book i know it just came out on the 13th right july 13th july 13th just came out i know we actually just sold out our first printing so we're pushing the second printing right now thank you that's so exciting i would love to have you back i i would love to ask my audience to give me some questions beforehand maybe i can have you on with the live i think the people who follow this channel really care about meritocracy and you know everything that we talked about. So yeah. you know your voice is very needed in this country right now. And uh, are you safe? Like, I mean, were you born in America or in China? I was born in Maryland. I was so I was oh. born in America. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my parents were immigrants from China. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> recently we've been talking about this, like, uh, I think MSNBC covered how the, you know, CCP is, like, trying to censor Chinese people even on YouTube to, mm. yeah, I mean, I will send you the article, but the thing, but the good thing is that I think majority of people are agreeing with us and seeing this madness is going to yeah. kill us all eventually. <laughs> if we go this direction and do not stop this, uh, I don't know what even, like, it was self-destruction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, voluntarily they're trying to destroy their country. Right. Without any, like, detail of pulling their gun in their head, right? Like, they're on, they're on choosing this path of, you know, like, going to her. Right. We, we it's, it's a, we're heading in, in the direction that you, that your race is going to become more important to you than your own individual merit. And that is... The worst direction that we could possibly head as a country. Yeah, that's why we gotta join you, colorusunited.org, and we right. are going to do this fight together. So thank you, Kenny, for everything that you have shared, and I cannot have to you. I cannot wait to have you back here. Oh, I'm excited. Thank you, Yunmi.